Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Jordan Lewis, and I'm a senior advisor at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. This afternoon, we're going to be discussing the new Indigent Defense Grant Program and address any questions you have about this process. I'm joined by a number of my colleagues today, including Heather Hewitt, who is an executive assistant in our office, and will be covering the application process on e-grants for us. The grant opportunity closes next Thursday on May 23rd, and there are many opportunities to reach out and seek support from PCCD before then, which we'll be covering today. Just a couple quick housekeeping notes before we begin. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on PCCD's website and YouTube channel once it's available. If you have any questions regarding the presentation or funding announcement, you can enter them in the Q&A box throughout the session and we will address them at the end. We cannot hear you and you cannot unmute yourself to speak up, so the Q&A box is how we will get to questions later. We'll start with a brief overview of PCCD, the Indigent Defense Advisory Committee, and the new grant program. Then we'll dive into more specifics about the funding announcement and the application process, particularly details about the e-grants application system. We'll provide resources on how to ask questions and seek additional support regarding the funding opportunity, answer some frequently asked questions that have been coming in to us to date, and then open it up to questions from you all at the end. But first, a little bit about our agency. The Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, or PCCD, was established in 1978 under Pennsylvania state law and serves as the Commonwealth's justice planning and policy making agency. Our mission is to enhance the quality, coordination, and planning within the criminal and juvenile justice systems, to facilitate the delivery of services to victims of crime, and to increase the safety of our communities. We're a relatively small state agency housed within the executive office with approximately 150 employees working across four offices. We're directed by an overarching commission board, which is advised by seven different advisory committees and two training boards. PCCD's responsibilities and programs fall into a number of different areas, including funding and grants, technical assistance, data and research, victims compensation, and training, amongst other responsibilities. If you're interested in learning more about these areas, I encourage you to check out our website at pccd.pa.gov. This slide shows a snapshot of what PCCD's grant funds have supported in recent years with the overarching goal of addressing both emerging and longstanding public health challenges. Those grants address programs related to gun violence prevention, victim services, school safety and mental health, criminal justice system improvements, youth prevention, addressing the opioid epidemic, a variety of behavioral health and mental health initi initiatives, children's advocacy centers, juvenile justice system improvements, and law enforcement technology and training. PCCD's current chair is Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis and the executive director is Mike Pennington. As I mentioned previously, PCCD is directed by an overarching commission that is advised by a number of advisory committees. The grant program I'll be discussing today emerged from our newest committee highlighted here, the Indigent Defense Advisory Committee. Back in December, Act 34 was signed by Governor Shapiro, which established the Indigent Defense Advisory Committee, or IDAC, within PCCD. It's a fairly large committee with 27 members appointed by the Governor, General Assembly, and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Act 34 also authorized the use of state funds toward the new Indigent Defense Grant Program, of which $7.5 million was appropriated to PCCD for fiscal year 2023-24. There are many responsibilities of the IDAC listed in Act 34, but they can be boiled down to six key areas, which are number one, proposing minimum standards for indigent defense services in Pennsylvania and submitting these for adoption by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Number two, establishing a defender training library of programs either developed or approved by the committee. Number three, developing and adopting county level data reporting standards. 
Number four, adopting standards for the use of case management systems. Number five, identifying trends in indigent defense services and reporting on them every two years to the General Assembly, uh, the first uh, report of which is due next December, uh, hence our efforts to start doing some of that data collection here through this grant program, which we'll touch on shortly. And finally, number six, advising on grants distribution under the indigent defense grant program. Three weeks ago, the IDAC held their third meeting where they unanimous, unanimously approved two initial standards for indigent defense services in Pennsylvania. If you're familiar with the American Bar Association's 10 principles of a public defense delivery system, they are based on principles two and nine. Shortly after their approval, the two standards were transmitted to the Supreme Court for consideration. The text of the first standard is pasted here. You can also see them on the IDAC webpage on PCCD's website. I won't read it verbatim here, um, but as you can see, this standard is focused on funding, structure, and oversight of Pennsylvania's indigent defense system. It states that there, that there should be adequate state funding and oversight of providers, and that the system should be primarily made up of dedicated public defender officers, augmented by court appointed and conflict counsel. It states that compensation should be comparable to other public, publicly funded lawyers with a parity of resources between providers and the prosecution. And it states that salaries for attorneys and other staff, such as social workers and investigators, should be reasonable. The second standard is displayed here, and it is focused on essential components of effective indigent defense representation. It states that providers should adopt a client-centered approach and should have the sufficient assistance of specialized professionals to meet indigent defense needs, with funding made available as necessary to accomplish that. Providers should also work to address collateral issues relevant to their clients' cases and offer assistance or make referrals as necessary. I'm now going to provide an overview of the funding announcement, which was released on April 26, just a few days after the IDAC's meeting to approve its two prelim preliminary standards and a funding framework. As previously mentioned, Act 34 had appropriated $7.5 million in state funds to PCCD to administer the Indigent Defense Grant Program during fiscal year 2023-24. The funding framework approved by IDAC last month makes $6.75 million in non-competitive, formula-based funding available for Indigent Defense Services in Pennsylvania. Applications are due two weeks from today on May 23rd at 11.59 p.m. Applications that are approved at the commission meeting on June 12th will be for projects that are up to 18 months in length with a project period starting July 1st. All 67 counties in Pennsylvania are eligible to receive funding and county applicants shall ensure that their award supports their county's public defender office, court appointed counsel office if applicable, and any nonprofit corporations that serve as the countywide provider of indigent defense services. When we get to the application process section of this webinar, Heather will describe how public defender offices or others who are asked to contribute to their county's application can do this within e-grants. I know the font is very small on here, but the map on this slide shows the maximum allocation that each county is eligible for under this funding announcement. It ranges from nearly $91,000 to just over $141,000 per county. And I encourage you to check out Appendix A of the funding announcement, which breaks down each county's allocation under this grant program. There are a number of eligible and ineligible activities that these funds may support. Eligible activities include salaries and benefits for staff, which can include anyone from attorneys to social services staff, investigators, paralegals, administrative staff, etc. It can include efforts to recruit, promote, and or retain staff, such as bonuses efforts to improve data collection and reporting capacity, such as purchasing or upgrading case management software, 
training and professional development expenses for staff, obtaining technical assistance to improve the delivery of indigent defense services within the county, any expenses associated with travel and transportation, supplies and equipment, and really any other costs that are associated with indigent defense service gaps that are identified by the county and can improve capacity. As noted, funding requests must align with standards adopted by IDAC and recommended to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, which I shared a few slides ago and can also be found on page four of the funding announcement. There are also a few ineligible activities highlighted here as well. First, per Act 34, there is a restriction on using this funding toward any activity that supplants existing county spending on indigent defense services. And I'll go into more detail on the next slide with what that means. Additional ineligible, ineligible activities are fairly standard. Funds cannot be used to purchase land, to go toward lobbying and political contributions, building construction and vehicle purchases. Any activity that is not related to the provision of indigent defense services or falls significantly outside of the scope of this funding announcement is also not eligible. To go into more detail about supplantation, supplanting funds means that a recipient, in this case, county government, reduces funding that's already budgeted for an activity because grant funds are now available to fund that same activity. So requesting grant funding for activities, personnel, salaries, or equipment that are already included in the county's annual budget would be considered supplantation. Supplementing, however, is permitted under this opportunity. Supplementing occurs when grant funds are used to enhance existing funds toward program activities. Examples of supplementing may include hiring new staff, increasing hours of personnel above current budgeted levels, increasing salaries or compensation for existing staff, and other similar efforts to increase program capacity. If grant funding for a current position is ending on or before June 30th, 2024, Indigent Defense Grant Program funds can be used to support the position from July 1st up through December 31st, 2025. When building out the application, we encourage counties to also consider methods to streamline the identification of indigent defendants' eligibility for services and to reduce barriers to representation, as well as consider using funding to assist with planning, tracking, and assignment of cases to improve attorney workloads. An example of that might be utilizing case management systems. After awards are made, grantees are then required to submit quarterly program and fiscal reports through e-grants. There are performance indicator data elements that are outlined in the funding announcement document, and we encourage counties to think about how they will track and report on these data elements on a regular basis if they are not doing so already for other purposes. The first quarterly report will be due on October 20th, which will cover the first period starting July 1st through September 30th. If a county is not able to track a specific data element, they should let us know. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Heather Hewitt to walk you through the application process on eGrants. Thank you, Jordan. Good afternoon, everyone. If we could go to the next slide, please. So all counties must submit applications using PCCD's e-grant system, which can be found on our website. Um, awards will be presented for recommendation to the IDAC and the Commission in June uh, with project start date of July 1st, 2024. Um, please note applications must be submitted electronically in e-grants by 11.59 p.m. on May 23rd, which is next Thursday. Next slide. Thank you. So getting started in eGrants, um, the first thing you wanna do is create an account for yourself in eGrants. Um, 
this is based off of a keystone login. So if you do have a keystone login, you would actually use that login and, or I'm sorry, username and password to log into eGrants, which would um, turn into your eGrants login. Um, so there are links here, getting started in eGrants, and then the Keystone Login Guide, which will walk you through if you have a Keystone Login, if you don't have a Keystone Login, and that does make more sense when you actually um, kind of read through it. Uh, you do want to make sure that the, or your organization is registered in eGrants, um, and as you can see here, all counties are already registered, um, so nobody should have to worry about that. And then the third step is to request roles in eGrants, which um, allows you to have the rights, um, users, and permissions to actually work on your application. Next slide. <laughs> so the user roles, there are six unique roles. Um, the first two that you see here are the financial creator and the financial reader. Those pertain to fiscal information, uh, the budget, fiscal reports, et cetera. Um, the program um, creator and program reader, again, they uh, pertain to the program information, so the program section, program reports, et cetera. You'll notice that we have a creator role and a reader role. The reader roles are just that. It's like a read-only document. You can look, but you can't actually do any of the editing. So if you will be working on the application yourself in eGrants, you do want to make sure that you are assigned financial creator and or program creator. Uh, the submission role, if you will be submitting grant forms, applications, uh, modifications, et cetera, you do want to make sure that you have the submission role. Um, without that role, you would still be able to work on any of the application. You just could not actually click submit. Somebody else with that role would have to do it for you. And the last rule that we go over here is the user manager. So this is for the agency's grants. Um, please note you would still need the other roles that we just discussed if you would be working on um, other aspects of the application, but the user manager does just that. They manage the users that fall under the agency. And please note, you do need um, two users registered. Every agency must have two users registered in order to complete the grant application. Um, there are three contacts that we ask for in an application. And um, when you get in there, you'll see, you have a better idea of what we're pertaining to, but um, two of those users cannot be the same. So you couldn't have three people be all the same person. Next slide. Okay, again, uh, the user manager, every agency should have one. Um, they approve role requests. They maintain existing security for users that are already established. Um, and we do have a user manager help guide that's on our website um, under the eGrants icon. User roles and accessing grants. So when you request user roles, you will select whether you are requesting access to all of the grants that are under the county or select grants. So it's kind of small here, but if you look at the, the image, um, you'll see when you go to select your roles, there's a drop down that you can select either all or you can select one of many grants that usually fall under the counties. Um, if you have already, well, Sorry, let me back up. Yep, if you, I'm sorry. If you did create a new application, but you do not see it on this list, please do not create another new application. You'll just have to go back into this list and do another role request. Um, if you only have access to select grants, you will not automatically have access to the new application that you created. If you have access to all grants when you get started, as soon as you create that new application, you will have access to it. Um, and then again, you'll just need to complete a role request for that new application you've created. So in a nutshell, if you create a new application, you go in, you do not see it, please do not create another new application. Um, contact us, um, we can walk you through it and get you squared away.
And then um, here's just some application tips. Make sure that the right individuals have access to the e-grant system. Again, users need to be registered and affiliated with the county in order to contribute to the process. Um, and again, just a reminder, applications must be submitted by the county and not a specific department or office. Uh, make sure you gather available data and information based on questions and fields in the application. The written funding announcement document is a good starting point for seeing what you'll be asked to provide. Um, and again, that's listed on our website and it's in the chat right now if you want to click on that link. Um, if you don't have data on hand, flag it in your submitted application. Um, we're asking counties to provide baseline data elements as part of this funding announcement to fulfill data-related responsibilities of the committee outlined in Act 34. And if you don't have the data readily available in time to submit, please include information in the application narrative or as an attachment just to explain what elements your county can and can't produce. And if you need any uh, assistance, the eGrants Help Desk is available at the email address or the phone number on your screen, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, and then we also have some links here. Um, we have great resources on our website, um, a lot of visual walkthrough guides um, that are really helpful. Um, so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And Jordan, I think I'm passing it back to you. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, before we dive into some frequently asked questions, I wanted to just give a quick overview of how you can reach out to PCCD if you still need assistance and you don't see your question answered anywhere. So as mentioned, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website and our YouTube channel when it's available. So please feel free to refer back to the information here if needed. You can also email PCCD staff at any time at the email address ra-pccd underscore executive ofc at pa.gov. Any new questions coming into this account will be answered and then also posted on our online Q&A page, which is also linked here. We encourage you to check out the Q&A before reaching out because it may have already been answered. Um, that Q&A document is updated several times and uploaded to the website uh, several times throughout each week. And finally, just a friendly reminder before we jump into questions, this funding opportunity is not competitive. Um, I know that e-grants may be new to many folks who are tuning into this webinar, and it may be a bit overwhelming. Um, I am personally also learning a lot about e-grants as a PCCD employee right now. Uh, but as long as you get an application in and you're asking for funding for eligible programs and activities, this is essentially guaranteed funding for your county. To date, we have received two submitted applications and 46 additional counties have also started a draft. So folks have been getting in there and working on it. Um, I also want to give some reassurance that once grant funds are issued, there are opportunities to flag any issues you're having with PCCD staff and submit a project modification request if needed. Uh, so for example, if you're looking to hire a new staff person but struggling to do so, just let us know and we can advise on potential options to adjust project expenditures or timelines if needed. Um, some of these concerns are also why we elected to make the funding time frame 18 months instead of 12 months. So again, please remember as you're filling out this application that despite everything that does go into submitting it, um, you're not competing against other counties for this funding. So now we're gonna dive into some of the questions that we've been seeing more frequently. Again, a full list of questions we've received to date are included in the online Q&A document. The first question is, will counties be able to submit applications if they don't have answers to everything on the current Indigent Defense Services application page? 
We have received several questions about the data related fields in the application and wanted to clarify expectations here, both for the application process itself, as well as for the performance indicators that counties will be asked to report on quarterly after the award begins. So first, just a bit of context, you might recall that one of the areas laid out in Act 34 was related to IDAC's role in collecting data and information from counties. PCCD is working to utilize available data sets at the state level to address as much of the areas in Act 34 as we can, but there are some key data elements that we can only get from counties directly. That said, we of course recognize this is a brand new process and certainly understand that not all counties are in the same starting point when it comes to data that you track, collect, report, et cetera. So with all that in mind, the application prompts input for a number of data fields and other information. However, only a portion of these fields and questions are considered required in the e-grant system. Uh, required meaning you cannot move forward in the application uh, and submission until you respond to them. You can see a list of those questions on this slide, and we've also updated the written funding announcement with asterisks to indicate the required questions. In total of the roughly 55 questions in this section, only 18 are actually required. There's a separate section in the application that lists performance indicator data, which is what will need to be submitted quarterly to PCCD after the award is made. In both instances, if your county is unable to answer a required question, please indicate this in the proposal narrative, or if it's a numeric field, you can enter 999 as dummy data so that it's clear to us that it's not available at this time. I also want to highlight, you'll notice this golden hammer tool pictured on the bottom of this slide. Clicking that in eGrants will give you instructions on how to answer a question, but it does not necessarily mean that the question is required to answer. If you didn't have a chance to quickly scribble down information from this slide on which questions are required, um, again, the funding announcement was updated with asterisks to indicate required questions. And we also list these specific questions here in the Q&A document online. The second question is, must the application come from the county commissioner's office? Can the public defender office submit as the applicant agency? Um, hopefully folks have been able to garner at this point that the applicant agency is the county commissioners or county chief executive, which are already registered and set up in e-grants. But yes, the public defender office may also register as an e-grants user and request access to the county application. The third most common question we've received is along the lines of whether funding for personnel must be limited to new positions. Um, as we discussed per Act 34, funding must supplement, not supplant existing spending on indigent defense services, but it doesn't necessarily have to be used to hire new staff. So examples of supplementing current county funding may also include increasing hours of personnel above current budgeted levels, increasing salaries of current staff, funding a position whose current funding ends before the grant period, and any other personnel activity that generally aims to increase program activity or capacity. Number four, we've been asked if funding would be available on an ongoing basis. Future indigent defense funding is currently contingent upon the budget that the General Assembly passes and Governor Shapiro signs. Uh, as many of you probably know, budget season is rapidly approaching in Harrisburg, and we hope we'll start to get some clarity on this in the next few weeks. For the upcoming fiscal year, Governor Shapiro has proposed $10 million in state funding towards indigent defense, which is a $2.5 million increase in current funding levels. So we're very hopeful, uh, but at this point we cannot definitively say that it is guaranteed. And finally, the last question we'll cover on this webinar is one I alluded to earlier, and that is, if our county wants to hire somebody, but it takes a long time, will we need to return part of the grant? 
The answer to that partially lies in how funds are made available to recipients, and that's on a reimbursement basis. So we encourage grantees who are experiencing any difficulties in implementing their proposed project to reach out to your assigned program and fiscal staff, which will be noted on eGrants, and have a conversation with us to talk through your potential options. A project modification request or PMR may be necessary to adjust any expenditures or timelines if necessary. So I wanna thank you all again for taking time out of your afternoon to learn more about this process and certainly for your interest in bringing these grant funds to your county to support indigent defense services. Um, I've listed on this slide here two email addresses if you have additional questions as you're going through the process, one of which is e-grant specific or you can call our e-grants help desk. Also linked here is the online Q&A document, which we encourage you to check before submitting a question as it may already be answered. And at this time, we will go through uh, the written questions that were submitted throughout this presentation. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sam Cook. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning uh, here at PCCD, working closely with Jordan on this project um, and happy to serve as uh, your Q&A MC uh, for this portion of our webinar. Um, so if you have a question that you haven't had a chance yet to enter into the Q&A function, please feel free to do that. Um, we have a couple that are budget related and fiscal related that I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Chris Epica uh, to tackle. And the first one comes from Katie uh, and it relates to uh, salaries and benefits. So her question is uh, for staffing, is it okay to apply all funds to salaries and not benefits or does it need to be the same percent spread across salaries and benefits like 60% of salary, 60% of benefits? Um, Chris, do you have any advice for Katie and others who may have a similar question? Sure. And thank you, Sam. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would say typically we do see it um, personnel budgeted um, an equal amount in personnel and benefits, but it's certainly not required that way uh, to be that way. Uh, if you prefer, you can um, just budget for a position salary in the personnel section. There's also um, a justification field that's a text field that if you would like to provide more information as to why you're doing that or um, or who would possibly be picking up the benefits, there's an opportunity for you to provide that information to us as well. Wonderful. Thanks for clarifying that, Chris. Um, so our second budget related question, um, also from Katie, uh, for the budget and e-grants, should the budget be under the county commissioners or should the public defender office be listed as a sub agency and the budget applied to the PD office? So I think this kind of gets at applicant budgets versus sub recipient budgets. So I don't know, Chris, if you can offer some uh, pearls of wisdom here on that approach. Sure. Um, when you first start your application, um, your county will be listed as the applicant automatically. Um, the recipient will be blank. There's a button to add the recipient agency. At that point, you can add the county public defender office. Um, and then when you first go to the budget, you'll encounter a screen. It'll ask you what type of budget this is. Um, for a county public defender office, you're going to want to choose agency budget. The other option is a pass through budget, and that is for more of a sub recipient external agency. Um, so again, just when you go to the budget piece, select agency budget, and there is an opportunity on the in the first page, the main summary page, just to enter your county public defender office as the recipient. Perfect. Um, one question we got, uh, Chris, you can take a breather because it's not budget related, um, but we did get a data related question um, and Jordan, I might pass this one to you. So um, this individual is asking to confirm that for this grant application, uh, the uh, information about how many clients signed up for each level of their case is not something that's a required field. Do you mind offering a response to that? Sure, that's correct. Um, and I think that question comes from probably the performance indicators section of the grant application. So if you don't have that data available um, or don't want to kind of look ahead and, and, you know, select a goal, so to speak, for that number, you can go ahead and enter 999 um, in the numeric field for that question. 
Yeah, and just to offer a little bit of context too, because for the performance indicator section, um, you know, this really part of the reason it's uh, sort of showing up as required is in part because it's asking for target values. So if you're a county who has kind of a robust data set available and you want to use that to enter kind of what you would assume to be sort of the, the quote unquote normal value that you'd be entering on a quarterly basis, please feel free to do that. But otherwise, to Jordan's point, um, the main purpose of this section of the funding announcement and the application is primarily to give you all kind of a preview of what we would be asking counties to enter on a quarterly basis moving ahead through program reports. And I also want to caveat, you know, as with the baseline measures as part of the kind of current services application section, we certainly recognize that, you know, a quarter from now counties won't magically be able to kind of materialize some of these data points if they were struggling with those in the application stage. Um, and so we just ask that you kind of be open and work with our program staff as you kind of get onboarded into uh, the grant award process, just so we kind of know up front which performance indicators might be easier for you to track along with compared to others. Um, we really try to be comprehensive with this list, recognizing that our Indigent Defense Advisory Committee has a pretty tall um, lift in front of us in terms of documenting kind of current needs across our entire uh, Commonwealth. And so we wanted to be as widespread as we could in terms of capturing some information that, again, is not uh, really readily available through some of the other data sets that PCCD has access to as the state's uh, Justice uh, Policymaking and Statistical Analysis Center. Um, so I hope that was helpful uh, to that individual who asked the question. Um, I am not seeing any new questions come in. So if you have a burning question, you've been on the fence about asking it, um, make sure to hit uh, submit on that so that we can answer it. Otherwise, a reminder that you can always submit your questions via email uh, to the resource account that's listed on this slide and our team would be happy uh, to answer that for you via email. I see a question just came in from Karen. Thanks for uh, taking me up on the offer to get that last minute one in. Uh, so Karen is asking, and I, I think this is probably a half question for Heather and maybe a half question for Chris. Um, so Karen is asking if on the main summary uh, section of the eGrants application, uh, if she's not the financial officer listed, can she still edit financial information? Uh, for example, is this different than being the financial creator? So. I'm not sure Heather or Chris who wants to rock, paper, scissor for that, but uh, either of you want to go first? I can start that and if Chris wants to correct me. Um, so if you're not listed as the financial officer on that drop down, that's OK. You can still be you can still work on the financial information. You just want to make sure that you actually have that role as the financial creator, um, which is different from being the financial officer. Um, and you could have 10 different financial officers for the same grant, or not financial officers, I'm sorry, um, financial creators. It it doesn't matter, it, but yeah, you can do both. Chris, anything to add to that? No, I think Heather, Heather, uh, Heather got it. Um, nice. Perfect. She has a, she has a habit of doing that. She's great. Yeah. Um, so we did get another eGrants related question also on the budget details section. Uh, so this individual is asking, uh, saying they're currently unable to access anything in the budget details section other than just one line, uh, which seems to be the total. So uh, they're saying there's no budget narrative or justification area showing up. Uh, Heather and or Chris, do you have any tips for this individual in terms of what might be what, be, what might be necessary uh, to make those fields kind of active? I'll, I'll go ahead and then Heather, you can jump in and mm -hmm. based on your experience with these questions. I, my guess is that um, there should be, you should see a link uh, for the agency on the budget. If you click that link, that's how you get to the categories where you can enter the line item details. So once you click the link for the agencies, you'll then see all the categories. Uh, then you would click the link for the particular category where you want to enter the line item detail. Um, I think that's probably what the issue would be. Um, Heather, uh, any, any other no, thoughts on that? No, I completely agree, but I do want to follow up with, um, so this person has already gotten to that budget section. Um, if for some reason you can't click on your budget up at the top 
Um, it's most likely because you don't have a financial officer in place. Um, so just keep that in mind, kind of as you work through entering information on your main summary, I like to say it unlocks things. Um, so once you put that financial officer in, you'll have access to your budget um, and so forth. But yeah, I agree with Chris that at that point, it's you just got to click in the right spot. Thank you both. Um, we have a question on on signatures, so I think Chris, I'll probably pass this to you. But before I do, I just just to reiterate, um, if you find uh, sort of Heather's insights helpful, which I know I do, um, just a friendly reminder that because this is not a competitive application process, we really are able here at PCCD to be much more hands on with helping you as you navigate and build your eGrants application. So if this is something that you're feeling kind of overwhelmed by or new to the process, please don't hesitate to pick up the phone um, or send our team an email and we can set up some time to work with you and get those issues resolved in real time um, as much as we can. So just wanted to put that plug in there because I know for some counties, um, you may be more familiar with some of our kind of competitive procedures. Um, so because this is non-competitive, just wanted to reiterate that uh, you can access the, the wisdom and uh, wonderful talents of our team. Um, I won't say 24 seven because it's during normal business hours, but um, please don't be shy if you have questions. Um, so I mentioned signatures. Uh, Chris, this question I think can go to you. Um, Karen is asking, should the signatories on main summary be listed as the county commissioners? Thoughts on that question? Yes, they, it should be. Um, that signatory space is for who actually signs the application. Now, the good news for counties is we know who all those folks are, so that is not a required field. You don't actually have to fill that in. You're more than welcome to if you want to, but it's not required. We, we will take care of that once it's submitted. Wonderful. And I know we got this question um, and it's in our Q&A page, but um, you might notice that there's a line that says district attorney. That is only for a subset of our funding streams. So you do not need to have um, district attorney signatures on the signature page of the application. I know that came up um, kind of as an inquiry previously. Um, so to do a last call of sorts, um, I'm not seeing any new questions. Again, a reminder if you had any uh, questions you want to send our way, please feel free to email. Um, so I think at this point, Jordan, I will turn things back over to you for some closing thoughts. Sure. Thanks so much, Sam and Heather and Chris um, for helping us get through those questions. Just one last reminder that a recording of this webinar will be posted to PCCD's website and YouTube channel if you need to access it again um, or, you know, feel free to share it out. If you had uh, friends that were not able to join, you feel free to share that link out. Uh, thanks again for your time this afternoon. Uh, again, reach out with any questions at any time and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.